In 2002, almost 613 million passengers flew out of U.S. airports. In 2022, that number was more than 850 million. Here at Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, American Airlines prepares up to 15,000 meals a day, now with the help of robots, for more than 800 flights daily. As airport lounges become more accessible, overcrowding can become a problem. Airlines have been spending big to add more space and comfort on board. So I just took a flight from Newark to Milwaukee on United. I paid $8 and the internet basically didn't work. The demands of in-flight connectivity by the passengers have grown rapidly, way faster than any of the providers could keep up with. Airport lounges are popping up everywhere, and almost every major airline and credit card company seems to want to get in on it. You bailed in an airport, it's very pricey. They're spending millions of dollars to attract customers and keep them spending. Customers reward companies that take care of them, and we feel really strongly that the lounges are a big part of that for us. If you pay up and you're willing to commit to that airline over the long term and make it like a partner basically for your travel experience and they're willing to reward you with, with better perks. More than half of frequent travelers surveyed visit a lounge at some point during their journeys. But as their popularity increases, so do the challenges of operating them, like overcrowding. After scavenging the grounds, I finally found a table. Once again, it is Hunger Games, true Hunger Games, to get into a lounge and actually find a seat. I would say any wait is too long, and we are doing everything we can to minimize that. As companies invest more money and effort into improving travel, loyalty status and lounge access are becoming increasingly harder to qualify for. There are over 3,200 airport lounges worldwide. The United States has more than 300 of them, with individual airports in New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco home to the most locations. And there's a lot of ways you can qualify to get into them. First and business class tickets will typically come with lounge access for most international travel. But airlines like American, United, and Delta restrict lounge entry for most domestic flights. Many major airlines also have branded credit cards that allow you to earn frequent flyer miles from everyday purchases to use toward free flights. You get to earn elite status when you reach certain spending thresholds. Status at an airline comes with a host of benefits like free seat upgrades, free checked bags, premium customer service, and of course, lounge access. Modern lounges often include amenities like an open bar, unlimited food, spas, gym, and even local art installations. In Boston specifically, we have a tap room, right, which really kind of leans into the Boston beer culture, but with a sapphire twist. Chase, Capital One, and American Express also have their own lines of premium travel credit cards that are not airline-specific. These cards earn points and miles that can then be transferred to a number of different airlines. Chase and Capital One are both in the early stages of creating a lounge network of their own. Capital One launched its first in 2021 in Dallas, and Chase opened its first U.S. lounge in Boston of May of 2023. Chase has announced the creation of five more. Lounges continues to be the number one reason why a lot of our customers get and keep the card. So it was natural extension for us to move into creating our own proprietary lounge network. Lounge investment and lower annual fees are keeping these cards competitive in the travel space to rival the American Express Platinum, which offers access to its signature Centurion Lounge system. And while these premium travel credit cards aren't cheap, they offer travel credit kickbacks of up to $300. The first Centurion Lounge was created in Las Vegas in 2013. And since then, American Express has added over 20 locations worldwide. The company currently operates 13 of them in the United States, with more on the way. 20% of overall foot volume on airlines are, are business travel, are high frequency travelers and whatnot. And the other 80% are people that travel maybe only once a year. And so you don't necessarily have a loyalty to an airline at that point, but you may have loyalty to a credit card. Premium tickets for those in business class are becoming more readily available and customers appear more willing to pay for the additional space. For example, from 2009 to 2019, the share of premium Delta tickets sold rose dramatically. United expects to increase its number of premium seats by 75% by 2026. Overall, the average airline ticket price has also steadily decreased over the past 25 years. Adjusting for inflation, domestic flights averaged over $575 in 1995. Today, the average trip costs $382. 
historically the difference between first class and economy was some eye popping number. Today it's much more reasonable and it's, you know, the minute you try it, the more likely you're gonna try it again in the future. As lounges become more accessible, overcrowding can become a problem. We added 900 seats last year. Um, we are adding 2,700 seats this year. So that is every action we're taking, that's what we're taking it for so that our customers won't have to wait. Delta told CNBC that it is not considering a reservation system for access to its lounges. Reservation is a complicated system at the end because you're arriving from a flight or you're taking an Uber from the city 15, 20 minutes late. Do I hold you see it? Do I give it away? It works in, in the restaurant scene when you have a table assigned to you. This is a little bit more complicated. American Express allows its Centurion Lounge guests to check in via a mobile app, but access is still not guaranteed. Capital One is currently experimenting with a digital waitlist system. We are testing in our app now, and I would think of the digital waitlist less like a reservation and more like the ability to kind of join a list ahead of time so that your place in line is secured and less of a guaranteed table. In 1940, American Airlines introduced the first lounge for customers at the New York Municipal Terminal, now LaGuardia Airport. There were no membership dues, but you had to be invited. The clubs became so coveted that in 1967, American Airlines opened its doors to anyone that would pay its annual dues of $25. Lifetime memberships went for $250. That would be equivalent to just over $2,000 accounting for inflation in 2023. The 1960s saw the expansion of airport lounges across carriers. The Trans World Airlines sunken lounge still exists today in the TWA Hotel with themed cocktails and decor from the decade. American Airlines Advantage program was launched in 1981, and just like its first private lounge, membership started out by invitation only for the airline's most frequent travelers. United and Delta both launched loyalty programs that same year. Loyalty programs arose after the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978 and removed government controls over industry prices. The intent was to allow market forces to determine the prices going forward. The rise of loyalty programs fueled the transformation of airlines going from upscale waiting areas to immersive luxury experiences by the 1980s. As we've seen kind of the volume of guests who are interested in having access to a lounge as that's grown, we've worked to continue to add new locations and expand the locations we have to make sure that we can accommodate those guests. As more people traveled, lounges became more in demand and more accessible. In 2002, almost 613 million passengers flew out of U.S. airports. In 2022, that number was more than 850 million. Lounge experiences in the past have typically been designed more around business travelers. And today, people are traveling very differently than they did, you know, 10, 15 years ago. They're traveling more with family and friends and in groups and, you know, blending business and leisure travel. Airlines and credit card companies spend millions to secure space in an airport but these lounges aren't making them much money, at least not directly. It's not a money maker for us. It's about offering that experience for people who pay a premium to fly on Delta. Uh, we don't look at them as a profit center. We need to ensure that they serve the purpose why we build them, which is, you know, really making the lounge a reason to fly the airline. That's our main goal. Delta, for example, they're expecting to get their Amex contribution up to about $10 billion over the long term. So it's a big number. Right now, loyalty in general is about, call it 10 to 15% of overall revenue for a larger airline. And for premium travel credit cards like Chase, American Express, and Capital One, the main goal is new customers. Airport lounges in general are the, the number one reason why someone would sign up for the credit card. The pandemic created a $35 billion loss for U.S. airlines. Pent-up travel demand has since led to people flocking back. People's pent-up demand to get out and see the world and, and willing to invest in premium products. And thankfully, the airline was one of the products that people are willing to invest. The trend toward premiumization started before the pandemic and has since taken off. Overall economy seats uh, from a configuration standpoint really haven't grown in 10 years or so, uh, maybe even 20. So it's been a long time since the economy uh, section has, has grown, but really the, the growth in, in overall seats has really been more on the premium side. But this travel surge may be cooling off according to some analysts. 
American has partnered loyalty programs with British Airways for three of their lounges at JFK International Airport. The first time that we uh, have partnered with them to this degree in really from the beginning designing and creating these joint lounges. And so the three joint premium lounges here at JFK are truly just cabin or status-based entry. It's not a credit card or a membership that gets you in. This relationship dates back to 1982, when American Airlines and British Airways first partnered their loyalty programs, laying the foundation for modern-day airline alliances. Please do not get mad at the messenger. But we have some annoying news for Delta's most frequent flyers. On September 13th, 2023, Delta announced changes to its SkyMiles program, causing customer backlash. They don't care how much you fly, they just care how much money you spend. A month later, the company said it would be walking back some of the more stringent changes. However, Delta Sky Miles Reserve and American Express Platinum cardholders who currently enjoy unlimited Sky Club access will still need to spend at least $75,000 for the same privilege beginning in 2025. Unless you hold an annual membership, which costs $695, starting as early as 2024, those flying basic economy with Delta will not be able to access its lounges. Delta joins American and United who have also raised their spending requirements to achieve status. This is a copycat industry in general. So if someone has a, the, the, the new shiny object, uh, there's, there's going to be a one-up at, at some point. That goes for labor, that goes for pricing, that goes for product, that goes for basically everything. Since the 1980s, economy seats in domestic airlines have lost anywhere from two to five inches in legroom pitch, with the least being Spirit Airlines with 28 inches. And seat width has shrunk too. At the same time, seats at the front of the plane have gotten bigger and more complex. Airlines have been spending big to add more space and comfort on board. In fact, airplane seats were a $2.6 billion market globally in 2022, almost half of what airlines spent on their aircraft interiors. Really at the heart of that onboard product is the seat. That's what you're going to be spending the most time in. The seats have developed from very simple seats to very complex, very comfortable and high-tech products. Seats are not all the same. On a typical aircraft, they range from economy to business to first class. And recently, airlines have seen a willingness among passengers to purchase more premium seats. Delta estimates its premium revenue will be 35% of total revenue this year, compared to 24% in 2014. Emirates introduced premium economy last summer, and since then, over 160,000 customers have bought up to this new cabin. Getting from A to B isn't necessarily what they're selling anymore. Anyone can do that. It's that experience within the cabin. Competition is heating up as airlines upgrade their cabins and design new premium seats with doors, privacy wings, wireless charging, even showers to win over customers. Other airlines are also very conscious that people are expecting a higher standard of experience and that will see them pay to go into higher classes. Premium economy seats cost more to make but bring in more revenue for the airline. The goal of the airlines is obviously to make money on all of these things. And part of that comes from making sure that passengers not only buy the ticket today, but also buy it next time they're on board. CNBC got an inside look at Recaro's aircraft seating factory to see how seats are made and to find out why they're becoming an increasingly important part of an airline's business. Aircraft seating has come a long way since the early days of commercial aviation, starting with wicker chairs, evolving to those with plush cushioning, and the ability to lie flat. Over the last few decades, changing technology and airlines' thin margins have impacted the layout of the cabin and design of seats. There are also rigorous safety requirements like crash and flammability testing, so that seats are certified to fly. They are designed for reliability. They build these things to withstand not just a passenger on them, but a 16G crash test experience. Seats and the space between them have also gotten smaller, especially in economy class, while passengers have gotten larger. Modern economy class seats are designed for people up to 5 foot 10 and under 180 pounds, reflecting passenger sizes in the early 1960s. But the average U.S. male is 200 pounds today. There are some manufacturers that are working on ways to squeeze a few more seats in from time to time, but I do think we're starting to get, in some cases, especially for long haul, 
towards the limits of what's reasonable and what passengers are actually going to be willing to fly. There are some regulations around seat pitch that make it harder to get too much closer together. You have to be able to evacuate the aircraft in a timely manner, and this, the closer the seats get, the harder that is. Cabin configuration has changed too, with more classes like basic economy, economy, extra legroom, premium economy, business, and first class. There's probably no more valuable real estate in the world than a square inch on an airplane that's about to take off, and especially in the premium cabins. And so the airlines work very, 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 very hard to optimize layouts of the seats. American Airlines, Delta, and United have been adding more premium seats to their fleets. Premium economy is really on the rise, and um, more and more airlines are switching a three-class layout to a four-class uh, layout. Premium economy is often a separate cabin in between business and economy that offers bigger seats for a higher price, with similar amenities, but not quite the lie-flat business class experience. Seats vary depending on the route in the airline. Typically, long-haul flights offer more legroom and comfort than those on shorter routes. Airlines like Emirates and Etihad sell full suites with closing doors, and some cabins offer access to a shower on board. 20-ish years ago it was, let's get to a flat bed so people can sleep on board. And today, we're starting to talk about more privacy on board, having an opportunity for passengers to sort of cocoon themselves in the cabin and not be interrupted by other passengers or by cabin crew. Airlines order seats from seat manufacturers, not from Boeing and Airbus. The market for aircraft seating is dominated by a couple players, Recaro, uh, Collins Aerospace. There are a lot, though, of other smaller players, especially as you start getting into the premium cabins. The airline customers we are working together with, the premium airlines, they are normally they are using it for 8 to 10 years, and then they are replacing the seats with the next generation. Seats can last up to 30 years, but top-tier airlines typically fly them for 8 to 10. After that, they are often sold to a lower-tier airline or refurbished. With the recent delays in new aircraft deliveries, airlines are pulling older jets out of retirement to keep up with the snapback in travel demand. And spending more for a new seat versus a refurbished seat may not make financial sense for the airline. It really is to do with the lift that the airline needs and how do they keep aircraft flying longer but at the same time being mindful that they wouldn't want to invest too much in an aircraft that's near the end of its life. An airline can have hundreds of planes in its fleet, and with each aircraft needing hundreds of seats, the cost can add up. For example, economy seats cost roughly $2,000 each. A business seat with all the bells and whistles like lying flat can range from seventy dollars to 100000 bringing the cost for a narrow-body jet with 16 business class seats and 150 in economy to nearly $2 million. Bigger planes like the A380 can have over 400 seats. From the airline perspective, figuring out which seat to go with is a complex math formula. How much is it going to cost me today? How many seats can I fit on board? How much is it going to cost me to maintain them going forward? The seats are way too cheap, I need to tell you. Because if you look into an aircraft, the seat and the cabin, it's less than 5% of the investment of the overall aircraft. If you're fitting out an A380 with the volume of seats, and you've got first class and business class, then you could easily get into tens of millions. If it's an A320 and it's completely fitted out with economy seats, it's in hundreds of thousands. And it, and it very much depends what you're changing. When it comes to designing a new seat, a lot of things come into play, like weight, costs, electronics, type of aircraft, and the route it flies. In the end, it's a differentiator. That's also the reason why the airline is willing to customize, to change and adapt the seat according to their needs, because all of them, they are flying more or less the same or similar aircraft. It's the first cabin product you'll see, generally speaking, when you get on board the aircraft. So it's really important to make a great first impression. People want a cabin experience where people come onto the cabin and, and are wowed. And that may be from the smallest things to really advanced systems, which really differ differentiate the experience. The hardest part for us is to get the most space out of a given environment and lower the weight to the absolute minimum. And all the electronic parts which are being added are taken away from that goal. Airlines and seat manufacturers are very secretive about their designs. All the new platforms are designed in-house from scratch. Usually then the airline comes with a certain idea and we 
collaborate with them and then we adjust the seats to their needs in terms of uh, trim and finish, colors, textiles, also uh, special features. Designing new seats takes several years. The time it takes to design a seat from scratch until it's put into service is roughly three years for economy and four for business class. U.S. airlines like Delta have been making a bigger push into premium seat offerings and said that premium growth is outpacing its main cabin, increasing 25 percent year over year. When we decided to embark on this new first class seat, we listened to our customers and they told us that there were four things that were really important to them. Privacy, stowage, productivity and comfort. So from a privacy perspective, you'll notice we have these great privacy wings that we've added to the seat as well as a center divider between the seats. In the back of the seat, we have both a personal item stowage as well as a laptop stowage. The new Delta first class seat started rolling out last year on the Airbus A321neo. It's a multi, multi-million dollar investment. There's 20 of them per aircraft. And we have 155 aircraft on order, so that's, that's a big chunk. And we have several programs uh, down the line that will receive this seat as well. There's a trend to more privacy due to the experience of the pandemic. So you, you have more of a cocoon situation, which is, feels better and it's easier to work in. Delta rivals United and JetBlue recently unveiled new first and business class seats with more privacy as well. United plans to offer wireless phone charging and winged headrests. The airline also offers its Polaris product, which are lie flat seats on some domestic routes. JetBlue recently redesigned its Mint class to offer seats with sliding doors. Now we do still see a demand for things like bars on aircrafts. You'll, you'll see that on 380s, the new 777s. I think really what uh, the airlines are trying to get the balance of is how do you give that privacy that you might get from a premium or a first class product and have those social areas such that the customer can pick. When they want to be uh, private, they can be private. Then when they want to socialize, they can go to social areas. A transatlantic ticket in business class can cost four times as much as in coach. The majority of seats on aircraft are made up of economy class, which has been hovering around 80 percent of the seat share on planes over the last five years. What the airlines and the customers are asking for, for sure, is comfort. In, say, economy, people want to have power at the seats. There really is a mix of some want IFE, so TV screens, where some want tablet holders. Airlines have spent years trying to fit as many seats into the economy cabin as possible. Airlines could reduce pitch a little more if they wanted to and probably get away with it. Uh, it does become a business question of whether passengers would continue to fly them or not. I do think we, we reached the limit. And well, we are still working on, on some products where we kind of uh, stretch the physical boundaries. As for standing or stack seats, that's not something we will see anytime soon. With all the certification requirements, which are there for a good reason, this really also slows down and limits somehow the possibilities for the different opportunities you might have maybe on a bus or on a train. The demand for seats will continue for the foreseeable future as the number of people traveling by air is expected to grow over the next two decades. So much so that an estimated 22,000 new aircraft are needed by the end of 2041 to keep up with demand. With the rebound of the industry and now the rebound, especially for a leisure traveler, is more or less back on a pre-COVID level. Business is lacking behind, but passengers who haven't traveled since quite some time they are booking normally one higher class. If they have booked before economy, now they are booking premium economy. Or if they've flown on premium economy before, now they are very often booking a business class, which means the, the planes are really filled from the front. As far as what kind of seats you can expect, the trends are pointing towards more premium products. We're starting to see flatbeds rolling out more and more across the A321XLR or LR families. We're seeing it on some 737 MAX fleet as well, depending on how far the airlines fly and what their sort of target market is. So that is definitely something that is a growing market and for the airlines that have that almost long haul international service that they're running on single aisle planes, it is going to be a trend for the foreseeable future. It's about how we tune the experience so that when you walk from your house to your car, to the aircraft, it, it's seamless. That's what people want. It's gonna be bringing more and more of those features that we see in, in automated homes and advanced cars, more and more of that coming into the aircraft, such that you have what you want when you want it and exactly the way that you wanna experience it.
Here at Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, American Airlines prepares up to 15,000 meals a day, now with the help of robots, for more than 800 flights daily. The airline just built this 214,000 square foot facility that features more automation to keep up with demand and to minimize catering delays, as the number of people traveling breaks new records, and globally, demand is expected to double by 2040. We have some of the highest load factors we've ever had in the history of American. And so we wanted to build the next generation of catering facility that would grow with us. Food service on domestic airlines has drastically changed in recent years. Airplane food is known for being horrible, but airlines do carry a lot of people and they carry them around the world and sometimes flights that can top 8, 12, sometimes 14 hours, and those passengers have to eat. Nearly 3 million passengers fly every day in the U.S. Post-pandemic, airlines have seen an increase in passengers buying up to premium seats putting pressure on airlines to offer better food options and more of them. The airlines want to have ways of getting business travelers to reject flying economy and demand first class. Airlines do not disclose publicly how much they make from selling food. It's considered ancillary revenue, which are services not included in the base fare, like baggage fees, priority boarding, and seat upgrades. Globally, airline ancillary revenue has grown from $42.6 billion in 2013 to nearly $103 billion in 2022. Running an airline is very expensive. So airlines like American, like Delta, they're going to look for places that they can cut costs wherever they can, whether it's getting meals to an aircraft faster, whether it's making those meals more cheaply, they're going to do that. CNBC flew to Texas to get a first look at American Airlines' new facility. Airline food has evolved a lot over the history of commercial aviation. During the 1950s, airlines served elaborate meals. But as flying grew in popularity, jets got bigger, airlines added more seats, and serving food became more complicated. Making airline food is difficult. If you think about how hard it is to cook for 10 people, imagine cooking for 200 people or 300 people at once. The airlines used to have all have their own flight kitchens, and during that time, you had an actual high level of diversity in airline food because of the fact you got this very fast response of, hey, the passengers don't like this, and there was an immediate, okay, we'll change to something else. Nowadays, airlines generally partner with catering companies. LSG Sky Chefs is one of the biggest, with 26% of total industry revenue in the U.S. One of the reasons airlines have cut back on food or for certain shock events, 9-11, when airlines were kind of careening toward bankruptcy, travel demand dried up, food was a very easy way for airlines to cut costs. Airlines eventually brought meals back, and many started charging for food in economy class. It's yet another common add-on item we see today, on top of baggage fees and seat upgrades. One of the numbers that you will never find that the airlines keep very, very secret is the amount that they pay their airline caterers for each meal, the actual cost. They make a spectacular profit on the meals that they sell. If they're selling you one of those lunch boxes for five bucks, 10 bucks, just think of what the actual costs are. They are trivial. International flights are a different story. Coach class passengers on a lot of those long haul flights are getting hot meals, but the first class meals are so much better. They're far more elaborate. They're multiple courses. And it's because those passengers are buying tickets that are 5,000, 6,000, sometimes topping $10,000. During the COVID-19 pandemic, meals were one of the first services to be cut. Airlines have brought back much of that service, and what we're seeing today is that consumers are more willing to spend when it comes to air travel. They want not just a better seat, but better technology in the seat, you know, better screens, better entertainment options, better Wi-Fi, and dining is also part of that experience. The amount of people flying and expected growth in air travel has led American Airlines to build its own kitchen in Dallas to keep up with demand. We are in our new state-of-the-art kitchen. This is the largest catering facility in the United States. Prior to this new facility, American's food was prepared in another building alongside other airlines. What we like about owning the kitchen is ultimately we have flexibility as our business needs change. Currently, we have contracted out with LSG Sky Chefs to be our exclusive provider in the kitchen for the foreseeable future. Dallas-Fort Worth International is American's world headquarters. The new facility makes meals for flights to Asia, South America, Europe, and domestic routes. We tailor our offerings based on where our, our customers are traveling to. The one constant 
is our customer preferences change. What they may have enjoyed last year isn't necessarily what they're going to enjoy tomorrow. So we continue to modify our in-flight dining and our footprint and what we actually make in the kitchen based on that feedback. American invested $100 million building this facility and is replacing some tasks with automation to speed up production. Like this machine that packs trays of drinks, which can reach up to 200,000 cans a day. It could even sort bad cans from good ones, a task that used to be done by people. When a plane lands, trucks and workers arrive and remove all the galley carts. They're emptied, cleaned, and restocked, and get prepared to be sent out to another flight. It allows us the ability to make the food fresh, prepare it fresh, store it really quickly in temperature-controlled areas, and then almost immediately put on the aircraft. So from the time of production to, to when our, our customers are enjoying it, can be as short as two hours, and maybe a little bit longer in, in different circumstances. First and business class meals are made fresh in a kitchen, packed on a tray and refrigerated until they're reheated in flight. Other items like snack boxes are prepared here too, in a temperature controlled room. The staff uses pictures to set each tray as menus change over the course of the year and from route to route. Airlines are under pressure to also provide more authentic dining. Sometimes they'll cater the plane based on the destinations, and it is a very complex thing. Menu fatigue is something that's very real in this industry, and so we're constantly striving to mix things up. In the very near future, we'll be using artificial intelligence to actually take photographs of our, our food as it comes back from the aircraft. This will help inform menu design in the future. The airlines use catering facilities around the world, but this is the first building American has built from the ground up. There are more than 1,000 LSG Sky Chef employees who work here. A fleet of over 100 trucks go back and forth from the facility to each aircraft every day to ensure planes can leave on time. It really doesn't matter what you serve. The number one outlier that is important to our customers is running an on-time operation. The demand for food will certainly continue to grow as more and more people will be traveling over the next several decades. But the bigger challenge may be more about the negative stigma about the food itself. The technology of cooking in flight is always going to be convection ovens. It is a moist style of cooking. You are steaming it. Americans love fried food. Why don't you give us fried food? Imagine working a deep fryer aboard an aircraft. No, don't. It's a terrible idea. The airline's ability to cater to our sense of flavor has changed because we not only know more about the technology of food, we know more about the physiology of us. The airlines are getting better at finding things that will work. Airlines will continue to use food to draw in customers as they fight to incentivize their airline's products and hopefully get them to pay more. Sometimes the coach passengers could even get a literal whiff of the food that the first class passengers are being served. Kind of the smell of freshly baked cookies, which is kind of like a, a trope of the, the class divide within an airplane. That's been going on for a long time, but you can actually kind of see how much better the passengers are being fed just a few inches away from you. Wi-Fi on airplanes isn't always great. For the first flight was with American Airlines, I paid $17 for internet and most of the time it didn't work. The second flight I was with Southwest, I paid $8 for internet and it really, pretty much ran the entire time. It just took two Delta flights. The first flight had really good Wi-Fi and it was free. The second flight, the Wi-Fi was not very good. It also wasn't free. It was $9.95. Nine. I just got off a United flight SFO to Newark and the Wi-Fi was okay. It was pretty good. Worked well, the speeds were fine. I was actually able to watch YouTube. So I just took a flight from Newark to Milwaukee on United. I paid $8 and the internet basically didn't work. I might even reach out to United for a refund because the internet was just so bad on that flight. The demands of in-flight connectivity by the passengers have grown rapidly, way faster than any of the providers could keep up with. We are chasing that at-home experience in the sky. We have to coordinate hitting a satellite in space that's 22,000 miles away when the aircraft moving on at 30,000 feet, 500 miles an hour. So the coordination of those two things is obviously super complex. American United and other U.S. airlines have been updating their fleets to provide better Wi-Fi. Delta has spent over $1 billion on its planes to bring free Wi-Fi to its customers. 
None of this is cheap to deliver into the airplanes. And part of it is just general ancillary revenue. But part of that is they really do believe that there's a better opportunity to make passengers happier and hope that they come back. It's been a disconnected environment for so long. How can this come up? You know, in our homes, they're getting more connected. Even our bodies are getting more connected with watches. Our cars are being connected. You know, why, why can't the airplane? CNBC got an inside look at how Delta is updating over 1,200 planes to improve Wi-Fi and why it's so difficult to get good Wi-Fi at 30,000 feet. Airplane Wi-Fi has been around for decades. Our breakthrough and our really start there was in the late 90s with it was a, it was a company called Connection by Boeing. It was an internet provided by Boeing as an initiative and we were a technology provider. It started with a long time ago with a satellite system that lasted a very short amount of time and then was quickly uh, became too expensive and scuttled. From there we went to cellular technology. It was the original GoGo air-to-ground product that survived for many, many years and it's still in service on some smaller regional jets. It's really been the past decade that passenger demand for internet on airplanes and the ability to deliver it has come about. And so that was, you know, started with the air-to-ground systems, it evolved into the satellite systems. The downside with cellular towers is you know, line of sight. You can't see it when it's on the ground, so it doesn't work at the gate. And as you get out of view of cell towers like over water, over the ocean, just in the remote areas, it doesn't work at all. Satellites give you a broader view of the aircraft, less obstructions because it's looking down at the top of the airplane. You don't have to worry about any of the line of sight issues. Because of this, more airlines are switching to satellite-based internet. It's probably only the last two years or so that there's been enough capacity available that many airlines could support the large volume of traffic that's being pushed across the satellite links, uh, which isn't to say they haven't all tried, but we're finally getting to the point now where there's enough satellites in the sky to be able to support that. Here's how it works. After passengers board a plane, devices connect to wireless access points, which are connected to a server or modem underneath where the passengers sit. This modem is connected to the antenna on top of the aircraft, which then talks to a satellite, which talks to ground stations to provide the internet. You know, each one of those spots has a bottleneck, and the satellite is really defining, you know, the defining characteristic of the entire network. The aircraft technology has gotten a lot better. Right? When you're trying to connect with a satellite 22,000 miles away with a signal that's width of a pencil, the accuracy of those technologies have to be really, really finite. So the new antennas that we're putting on aircraft now have a huge amount of fidelity for closing those connections. The satellite internet industry was a $7.9 billion market in 2022, and there are several big players in the space. Viasat is quickly growing and is about to overtake the top role. Panasonic Avionics is currently holding that top spot. Inmarsat, Intelsat, and of course SpaceX and Starlink coming on strong as well. Viasat provides satellite internet service for homes, defense communications, and airlines. Picking the right provider is a really expensive gamble in a lot of ways for the airlines. They have to look at what services are available today, what capacity is available today, and then also figure out where the system is going to be in two, three, five, maybe even 10 years, depending on what that contract looks like. Engines full power and lift off of Viasat 3. Go Viasat, go Falcon Heavy. Viasat recently launched the first satellite of three to expand its global coverage. These satellites orbit the Earth from space. One satellite can support coverage for an entire continent. And one of the features of that satellite, the new satellite, is expanded coverage. So right now, our, our coverage for Viasat is within, say, the continental United States, Mexico, Caribbean, and then parts of Brazil, and then the North Atlantic and Canada, over to Europe. But if you were to, say, fly from LA to Hawaii, all of a sudden you'd cut out because our satellites weren't covering Hawaii, or well, this new satellite will. And so often when it doesn't work, it's because of, it's not because of some other technical issue is because likely we just don't have the satellite coverage up yet, in which we're quickly expanding. Demand for Wi-Fi has grown tremendously over the past 10 years due to the growth of smartphones and users expecting access to the internet to be available everywhere, like airplanes, making capacity and bandwidth increasingly important. The newest satellite, Viasat 3, has speeds of up to one terabytes per second, compared to 260 gigabytes per second in Viasat 2. The busy airports like Atlanta, Dallas, O'Hare, you know, the New York area, you get a lot of planes on the ground at one time or in the, in the near airspace. So you have a high concentration of aircraft and users and demand. 
and often systems just don't have enough spot capacity. They just don't have enough to serve that demand. So it looks like it doesn't work. It's not really broken, it's working as designed. They just ran out of bandwidth. For airlines, that demand went from supplying Wi-Fi for a few business customers checking some emails to an entire plane, sometimes hundreds of people trying to stream movies. You get transcon flights where take rates can be uh, as much as 60, 70 percent. I was on a flight uh, this week where 118 passengers on board had 166 devices connected. It's absolutely a challenge. We wanted to deliver unfettered internet to our customers, meaning if you wanted to watch Netflix, you can. If you wanted to go to work, you could. If you want to scroll social media, you have the capacity to do that which means we really need to be able to provision enough capacity in the aircraft to let anybody do whatever they want. So being able to deliver that much power to a plane has its own challenges. When we first came in, Wi-Fi, let's say your internet connectivity and IFE, in-flight entertainment, were kind of viewed as two separate systems. I think we knew it was happening in the market was everyone's, everyone's was bringing content on board. It wasn't like bring your own device, it's always bring your own subscription. So the internet has become synonymous with entertainment. The need for more bandwidth on board also means aircraft, especially older planes in the fleet, need to be upgraded. New planes like Delta's 737 MAX 10s will come with Viasat already installed. When it comes to using Wi-Fi on a plane, it can vary widely depending on the route, the type, and age of the aircraft. Most airlines now offer free messaging, but when it comes to Wi-Fi, passengers can pay a range of prices. In our testing of various U.S. airlines, we paid anywhere from nothing to up to $29 per flight. A few airlines like Delta and JetBlue offer Wi-Fi for free, and some don't offer it at all. The airlines that have chosen to invest in Wi-Fi are doing it, and they're doing it pretty aggressively. You do have the other airlines, uh, Frontier, for example, who are an Allegiant. They don't want Wi-Fi on their planes right now. They're not doing it. We started way back in 2019 with a team of industry experts that we hired on specifically to go test and theorize the capabilities of all these satellite networks and providers on the airframe to find eventually Viasat that can deliver this experience. And we did that progressively from 2019 through 2021, 2022, as we led up to the confidence that we had to launch free Wi-Fi in February. Probably our fastest growing business line is the commercial aviation segment over the past, you know, say several five years. We visited Delta's Tech Ops Center in Atlanta to get a behind the scenes look at a 737's Wi-Fi system being upgraded. Team's already opened up the aircraft to start one, running the wires from the antenna, which will be around the middle of the aircraft, to the front where our server and modem is going to be, and then back through all the wireless access points that are going to distribute Wi-Fi to each of our passengers. As you transition through the plane, let's say you were in first class and you wanted to go to the lab in the middle, you would switch from the first wireless access point to the second to the third seamlessly as you transition from front to back. Delta's goal is to retrofit its entire fleet by the end of 2024 and are about halfway there. The airline believes by offering free Wi-Fi, it will acquire more loyal customers, and in the first month saw 100,000 new SkyMiles members. There has been a shift of late away from the ancillary revenue approach and more towards the, whether it's sort of Delta's decision that they think they can make more money with SkyMiles members and convincing everybody to join the program and having happy customers. JetBlue has offered free Wi-Fi for years. Since launching with JetBlue in December of 2013, we've now added American Airlines, United Airlines, Delta, and Southwest Airlines, and most recently Porter and Breeze, uh, two, two smaller carriers that are up and coming. Hawaiian expects to offer free Wi-Fi provided by SpaceX's Starlink on certain aircraft early next year. Outside the U.S., Singapore Airlines announced free Wi-Fi starting on July 1st, 2023. They all say, we think that the passengers will be happier and they'll probably buy another ticket next time. And we just hope that we can get a little more revenue from them on the next ticket in the fare rather than trying to sort of eke it out on as an ancillary separate line item. JetBlue has always said it's sort of part of their marketing costs. They've been free since they launched, so they know better than everyone. But I've yet to see an airline say that with the cost of the install and the ongoing sort of bandwidth charges, it's a profitable endeavor. The overall airplane Wi-Fi experience still greatly varies on availability and dependability. The regional jet world is definitely the last frontier for getting a decent performance. They're, the ones that are online are still generally running with the air-to-ground system that just doesn't have enough spectrum available. That's going to change starting early next year. But the investment airlines like Delta are putting into its Wi-Fi offering will only ramp up competition with rivals. We've been really passionate about free Wi-Fi for a long time now, but the technology really hasn't been there with the capacity in space and the aircraft 
hardware to really deliver that experience at scale. Now we're there and it, more and more satellites are being put into orbit every day. It's all the time now and that's just going to continually get better over time. The bad news is that's still probably not that great. There's a long way to go. The good news is that with more satellites launching to support the systems, we're starting to get to the point where the systems can handle the amount of demand that's being placed on them. That's probably the hardest thing for us to do is to get people to trust that it works online and you can depend on it. Bisat 3, all the things we've been doing and working, it's the technology and the hard work behind it that makes it reliable, makes it consistent, and makes it have all the capacity and then the satellite itself is fundamentally behind, that's the bottleneck. And if you solve that problem and you have enough capacity where there's demand, you're gonna make the system work and I think everyone's gonna be joyed instead of frustrated.